Today, we're going to be speaking with Sheila Heen, who's a Harvard Law School professor, founder of Triad Consulting and also co-author of the New York Times bestsellers Difficult Conversations, as well as Thanks for the Feedback. Uh, Sheila, it's really great to have you on today. I'm delighted to be here. So I've every week I get questions from people in my audience. Um, I have this very big political disagreement with my mom and I want to know how to handle it. Or I have this difficult situation with my coworkers politically and I want to know how to handle it. And uh, people ask me for advice. And one of the first things I say is, well, to figure out the right path forward, you kind of first have to think about what you want the outcome to be. In other words, in a political disagreement with your mom, what's more important, proving her wrong or maintaining a relationship with your mom, for example, depending on what what you expect might happen. So can you kind of open up by giving us a basic framework in terms of how to think generally about some of these difficult conversations that people sometimes have? Absolutely. And and David, I think you're right on the money, meaning I think one of the core questions is what is my purpose in having a conversation? Because if my purpose is to prove her wrong, that that is not necessarily going to change her mind. You may have noticed that. True. <laughs> um, right? Because it's totally clear to you that you have proven her wrong, and yet her views persist. Right. Um, and so I think that's part of the struggle, which is that um, I actually think that there are things that are hard about just being in relationship with someone who holds a view that you find incredibly disturbing, upsetting, wrongheaded, um, foolish, uninformed. Should we keep going? What right. would you add? All those <laughs> things. Yeah, right, right. And 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 it's important also because there's a range of I've as the example I give often is when people say, are you friends with like radical right people, for example, I'll say, listen, if someone thinks the tax rate should be two points lower than I do, it's not a big deal. It's just a disagreement. And we can kind of just work through that. It's not really going to affect too many things about my ability to relate to them. If they believe there's a secret cabal of Jews controlling every aspect of, you know, we're like, that's going to be a little bit different in terms of our ability yeah. to relate to relate to each other. So it seems like that context is important, too. I think that that's exactly right. And um, and so I think what we're talking about are views that feel like they hit at the core of who we are. Yes. Or that suggest a threat to something that we hold really dear. And so in this weird way, there's like an identity issue that comes with like, how could I, being who I am and what I care about and um, what I want people to see about who I am and respect about who I am. How could I be fill in the blank friends with family, with neighbors, with coworkers, with this person who the, at least the caricature of the view that they hold in some way invalidates, dismisses, or oppresses something that really matters to me about who I am. And just that, um, that identity quake that comes with that question, I think, is why we feel like we need to have a conversation with them. Right. And what's what would thinking of techniques, you know, sometimes it'll be like, hey, I, we need to talk or you said something that really offended me, starting with how yes. one felt. There's all these different tactics that that are often mentioned. Is there some universal best way to kind of start some of these conversations or does it really depend on who the person is and what you're going to talk about? So I think that the the thing that it depends most on is negotiating with yourself about your purpose. Yeah. So, for instance, the, the couple of examples that you just gave, if they just said something or did something that I want to raise, well, then there is a purpose to the conversation. And my purpose would be um, I want to share with you sort of what impact that had for me or why I found it upsetting or frustrating or um, that you're not really understanding something that feels important to me for you to understand. Right. So my purpose is actually to share something with you and to feel heard. Well, that's a purpose that I might be able to achieve, right? Right. Um, and if, if I've got my purpose aligned with something that feels realistic, well, then I can start by just sharing that purpose. Like, hey, whether or not you agree, I want you to understand why this matters to me. That would be a great 
purpose. And depending on the relationship, they may or may not say like, okay, or they may start explaining why you're wrong. Right. Yeah. You know, when I spoke to um, once I, I spoke to someone who has hired and fired lots of people, and I think this will be kind of parallel to what we're talking about. And he said one of the things he doesn't like, which he did early in his career when he would have to fire someone is he would bring them in and he would go, listen, um, so I want to talk because things haven't been going so well lately. And then the employee might say they haven't. I think things have been going fine. You're already yeah. derailed. Right. And you're kind of trying to back up. And so his his thing was he would go, listen, thanks for meeting with me. We're going to have to let you go. Let me explain to you why. And then you're putting out front that there's a decision and there's a reality here. And now it's just a matter of the kind of thinking it through and talking it through. Is that where does that fit into the techniques that you think can be useful? And is there something about that to instead of listen, um, remember the other day when we were talking about it's like, no, I don't remember that. Just saying we we had a conversation that left me feeling really upset with you. And I want to tell you what happened. I want to is, is there something about that as a technique? Totally, totally. So so one of the things that you're describing is what we would call a bad news conversation. Mm. Like there's something uh, that has been decided or there's something that matters to me. And the purpose of this conversation is partly to let you know that. Yeah. And if the purpose of the conversation is to let you know that, then I need to put the bad news up front. And what's funny is that if you ask people if somebody has bad news for you or needs to tell you something important, what what are your requests of them yeah almost everybody says like just tell me up front like don't tiptoe into it or hide the ball or make me guess but then when we're on the other side of the conversation we ease into it i've watched someone try to fire someone by asking them questions right <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think you'd be better off you know at a different organization and right. it's not like really because no, yeah. it was a friend of theirs right so we do it because because of some of the identity stuff that I was talking about, like I'm not the kind of person who hurts people's feelings. I'm not the kind of person who treats someone unfairly. And, and that's why a lot of getting ready to have a important conversation means negotiating with yourself. Like, well, what's true? You might hurt their feelings. Yeah. What's true? Maybe you are sensitive and, and maybe that's okay. So, and you need to let them know, like, look, this is just a topic on which I am sensitive. Yeah. We don't have to argue about whether I'm normal sensitive or oversensitive or you're insensitive. But if we're going to be in a relationship with each other, this is where we're at. One of the other um, situations that often comes up in the political space, and this is less about people in my audience, but more about some of the people that I talk about, politicians or public figures, is yeah. allegations are often made against people of all, all different kinds. And then often there's like an instant evaluation of how an individual reacts when accused of something. And unfortunately, what can be difficult about it is no matter how you react, it's sort of seen as though, like, of course, that's what being what's being said, you know, and, and whether the allegation is of some kind of criminality. We've seen this in the context of the Me Too movement, you know, all sorts of allegations. And if people say, I, I absolutely didn't do that. The reaction can often be, well, that's what everybody would say, at least initially. Right. Or most most people would. Or you, you kind of get the idea when there are yeah. accusations being hurled at you. What are some of the ways that are better to respond maybe than what we often see? Well, so um, I'll, I'll give an answer that I actually learned from someone else. So years ago, um, we were doing a program in collaboration with another group and and the other group included people who did internal investigations mm. within the CIA, FBI, et cetera. And so what they were teaching was um, how to read signals that someone might not be giving you the straight story. Yep. So one of the things that I learned from them is that one of the most common red flags is what's called a protest answer. Mm. So if you accuse me of fill in the blank, rather than saying, I absolutely did not do that. The person says, I can't even believe you would ask me that. Mm. I can't even believe you would have the nerve to et cetera, et cetera. So what's interesting is not that if I'm a truthful person and I didn't do what's being accused that I wouldn't be horrified that you're even asking or suspecting me. Um, but what they would say is if you are, innocent and telling the truth. The truth is your friend. So the right. first thing you're going to blurt out is the truth, which is like, of course not. Then you can add, 
I can't even believe you're asking me that. <laughs> so, so what's interesting is that you feel if you're on the, the being accused side of it, you feel both things. And it, and it can be tempting to think like, I shouldn't even have to say I didn't do it, but do say that you didn't do it. Right. So like a reaction, like, why would I do that? That might be where we say, well, you're not really denying it. I mean, is that sort of the, right, the non responsive to the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. The other the other um, observation that I learned from them was that the biggest mistake we make if we suspect something is going on is that we don't ask the direct question. Right. Right. And they're like, just ask the direct question and get a direct answer one way or another. And it's not that that proves anything like you can't be a human lie detector, but it's at least a flag to say, like, uh, you might want to look into it a little bit more. Yeah. In in police yeah. interviewing techniques, which I've read about a bit, one of the things that's often said and, you know, whether these things are always true or mostly true, I guess it, it depends, depends on circumstances. But it's when you're interviewing a truly innocent suspect they will typically get really mad as you continue to imply yeah. or suggest that they did something. They will genuinely get mad that they are being accused of this, whereas guilty people will do some of the things you're saying or or kind of react yeah. in other ways because it's genuinely infuriating to be accused of something that you just you just didn't do. Yeah. So so I think that's really important, which is it's not that you don't feel the fury or the indignance. So, so um, being transparent about that, even as you are simultaneously being transparent about what is not true. Right. Let me also say, David, that this is related to most difficult conversations because we're often having the conversation because something is wrong. Yeah. Right. Something has gone wrong. Somebody screwed something up. Somebody did or said something that's a problem. Um, and the and blame is a feature of most of those conversations. If it's not explicit, it's implicit. Like, you know, we need to talk about the fact that you don't seem to know how to run Zoom right. or use your microphone. <laughs> what is wrong with you? And and if the purpose of the conversation is actually to fix the problem, blame is often not helpful mm. um, because it's basically saying, let's talk about why you're the problem here. I'm the good guy and the victim, and you are the person who screwed it up and is incompetent. Right. And it's not surprising that not many people really want to be part of that conversation. Like, no, thank you. I don't want to be in that play with that being cast in that role. So, so part of what we talk about if you're actually trying to problem solve is um, shifting to talking about joint contribution. Like, what did we each do or fail to do that got us where we're at? Because that'll tell us what we need to change if we're going to fix the problem and not have it reoccur, right? Or be sure. in the same place next week. That's a little bit different than the political situations that you're talking about because they're not actually trying to solve a problem. No, it's usually no. about trying to, to to appear as though you got one over on whoever else you're exactly. speaking to or whatever the case may be. And that's really exactly. at cross purposes with much of the productive ways to have these conversations. I mean, it's interesting yeah. because uh, 80 percent of political speech in the United States is sort of structurally not even designed to achieve anything. Well, what is structurally designed to achieve is not a conversation with the other side. Right. It's a conversation with your base. Right. Yes. So so you are saying it because you think it is going to persuade or influence someone or something. It's just not what we're pretending it is across the aisle or um, across party lines. When it comes to when you're in the middle of some kind of tense exchange, and this could be a debate I'm having on my show with someone who disagrees with me or someone talking to their mom about whatever they said or, you know, whatever the case may be. Oftentimes there's this the, the emotion kind of blocks your ability to really think. And then after the fact, you often say, I knew so many other things that I could have said, but I didn't say, et cetera. How how can you stay kind of level headed during these exchanges? Well, so I would. um I would distinguish between being emotional and sharing emotion mm. because I would argue that you, in those exchanges, you've actually got two layers of things going on. One is the debate that we're trying to have or the issues that we're trying to, what, get one over on, persuade yeah. others you're right, or just better understand. And sure. so part of the advice is shift your purpose to, can we understand why we see this differently? If we can shift from proving that I'm right to it seems so obvious that I'm right, I'm just trying to understand why we see it differently. That's actually a productive conversation. But you've got a second layer going on under the surface, which 
is the emotions and relationship layer that that is all about how I feel treated in this exchange. Yeah, one tool exchange. along those lines that um, I've been told by a couple of different people is it can be useful to say, OK, let's say the topic is abortion. Uh, I'm pro choice. I'm talking to someone who's against abortion. Ask the other person why they believe you are pro choice to even see if they understand, even if they disagree with your framework, how you came to the conclusion and that number one, it's good to for everybody to have the knowledge. But just the ex exercise of it might put the person in a position that were they, just by even saying it, they might at least be more willing to understand your view, if not agree with it. I think that that's right. And, and what it highlights is that in any really good conversation um, or attempt to influence, by the way, um, you need two things. You need high quality assertion, like that you share your view with clarity and thoughtfulness and et cetera. But you also actually need high quality empathy mm. that you are really listening generously and deeply to each other to not to because I think I'm going to agree with you, but because in order to understand what might be persuasive to you, I actually have to understand what you think and why you think it. Yes. And then I can say, well, so here's what it feels like is left out of your view or that I worry about that. It sounds like you're not so worried about. So talk to me about that. So, so when we talk about high quality assertion, it actually has to be rooted in deep empathy and, and generous listening. So the move that you just suggested um, is a clever move, although it's basically backing the other person into a corner to say, be empathetic to me mm, first. Right. And some people will take that and say like, yeah, no, I actually think I can articulate your view and that's helpful. But if that doesn't work, it may be because you actually have to do it first. Right. That you need to say, so let me see if I can describe what you're saying and why you think what you think or feel the way that you feel. And then you can tell me what's left out of that. And then once they feel like you you really get it, their view, then you're in a great position to basically say like, okay, so let me say a little bit about why I see this differently. And I, I would love it if you could see if you can summarize it back to me, because this is just a complicated issue. Right. And that sense of reciprocity, which is one of the most robust findings in the literature, like if you attack me, I'm going to attack you back. Um, but if, if you're willing to listen to me and consider genuinely, authentically, why I think what I think or feel how I feel, well, then I almost feel an obligation to do the same for you. Right. So that would be like with the too. abortion example, it might be, hey, listen, totally. my my belief is you're against it because you believe life starts at conception so that any abortion is is like a murder. And but 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 can you give me a sense of why you think I am pro choice? And, and so I'm kind of doing yes. it first in a sense. Yes, you can. Um, or you, you might even tweak the question to say, can you give me a sense? And that's a genuine, can you, or do you feel like you need more context from me in order to understand mm. that? Right. 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 Because there's the, there's the general view of why people are on each side of this issue, but then there's the you view, like, why do you David care about this? Right. And, and often around these really important, hot issues, political issues, um, one of the things that I hear is just differences in what people worry most about. Mm. So someone who is pro-life worries most about the life of the child. They would say child. Sure. And murder. Someone who is pro-choice worries most about other people making choices for individuals. And what's interesting is that if you, we take a couple steps back politically, Republicans often worry most about individual choice and government interference in individual choices, which of course in abortion that's flipped. Yes. Um, whereas Democrats often worry most about the voices of those who are oppressed and not in the majority right. and equity, right? Or fairness. And so often one of the the ears I have on the conversation is whatever it is we're talking about, what is it that each of us is worried most about? Mm. And in some ways, I don't have to worry about what you're worried about because I know that you'll take care of it. Right. If there wasn't anybody protecting individual autonomy or choice from government, I would have to worry about it, but I can rely on you guys to worry about it. <laughs> so, so I can worry about something else that actually matters to us as a society as well. 
Super interesting. We've been speaking with Harvard Law School professor Sheila Heen, a co-author of The New York Times bestsellers, Difficult Conversations, as well as Thanks for the Feedback. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you.